Documentary filmmaker Joanna Hamilton uncovers one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in the history of the FBI. She reveals that before Edward Snowden, before the Pentagon Papers, there was media Pennsylvania. They risked everything. In 1971, unknown activists decided to go beyond protesting. Break into an FBI office, remove files, and mail them to newspapers. I knew that we would find stuff in that office. The documents exposed a massive secret surveillance operation that encompassed everything from infiltrating women's liberation meetings to spying on the Boy Scouts. The fortress was under siege. For more than 40 years, the criminals remained at large. Until now. 1971. Now. Only on Independent Lens. If, it's just like, I don't know how to describe it other than when you, when you recall something that was very intense for you. You remember being 20 or 21 years old. You remember being anxious. You remember being angry. You remember uh, being frustrated. You remember all the feelings that, that went along with, with, that, uh, with that time. Being responsible for the consequences of your actions was a big part of, of growing up. You know, you have to decide what you think is right, and that's what you're going to do. When I realized that so many things were so wrong, there was no decision to be made. You know, it's just you have to do something. the FBI is reported preparing to shut down some of the 500 small agencies it maintains around the country because of security reasons. Last month, more than a thousand documents were stolen from the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania. called themselves the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. They went down this corridor, past the local draft board, and somehow got through this door into the FBI office and stole all the files, documents, and correspondence there. Recent events have given more indication of the extent of government snooping on civilians. Stolen FBI records, which have been made public, include a letter... We've got to go two by two. The drummers and the caskets will lead. But before anybody does anything else, we should observe five minutes in which we will simply be silent with our own thoughts, with our prayers, with our visions of the future. When protests against the war in Vietnam were really taking off, we moved from New York to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was full of young families just like ourselves who were um, very active politically. And we found a community of war protest and draft resistance. We took our children to protests and rallies and people were arrested. 
Well, let's talk about the year 1968. I don't think our country has ever gotten over 1968. 68 began with the Tet Offensive. Then My Lai was in March. Uh, in April, oh my God, Martin was gone. And then Bobby got killed. You can see things are very rapidly unwinding inside of America. We needed to find new ways of exposing that war and opposing that war. I was ready to make a transition from nonviolent protest to nonviolent disruption. John and I began to learn about people who were going into draft boards and removing draft files and destroying them. And at that time, there was only a paper system. So if you destroyed the paper, you disrupted the system in a, ma in a major kind of way. So we really became a central part of that resistance movement in Philadelphia. People would stay for dinner and they'd play with the kids and read them bedtime stories. Then we'd go out and go casing at the draft board. It was very empowering to know that ordinary people could actually be smarter than the police and take action. In the spring of 1970, I'm thinking about the war a lot. And I end up going to a meeting and the, the whole idea there was to sort of explore the philosophical and ethical aspects of nonviolent civil disobedience type actions like the ones that the Bergens had taken in Catonsville. By the end of it, I knew that this was something I wanted to do. There was an organization called the Philadelphia Resistance and I participated in demonstrations in front of draft boards, but really I was much more invested in this idea of breaking into draft boards and removing files. So my first action was in Philadelphia, I think in May of 1970. And then there were a series of other actions after that. We wanted to do as much damage to, you know, what we thought of at the time as the war machine. We wanted to do as much damage to it as we could before we got caught. You know, I was reading all these scholarly books about the history of Vietnam and so on, and there weren't that many, actually. There was only a few. I really didn't know what to think at first because the factual story about the history of our involvement was just appalling, and it was um, completely contrary to everything that everybody else was telling me. I was like, the whole society has been lying to me up until now. I was angry that we would, that our country would do something like that. I was angry that they would lie about it. I was really angry that they would try to send me over there. <laughs> I heard about the Jackson State killings while we were, you know, in the planning stages of a, of a demonstration. There was a face-off between the police and a bunch of students, and the police alleged that somebody shot at them from the window of the dormitory and uh, two students were killed. Kent State was big news everywhere, but you didn't hear people talking about Jackson State nearly as much. I remember being in a car and they had the news on and they played a tape that a reporter on the scene had made at Jackson State. The gunfire sounded like machine gun fire. And it just went on and on and on and on and on. And I, you know, I just, <laughs> I have to do something about these bastards. I was done talking at that point. I mean, I'm like, I was really not interested in the conversational part of it anymore. It was like time to be confrontational. We're here because we think American lives and American values, as well as the lives of other human beings are at stake in Vietnam. We would like to see I was very much opposed to the war in Vietnam, as I was to preparations for war of any sort. I've seen the cars go by here with the hate-filled faces. There'll be people listening to this. You blame people for hating this. There'll be people listening to this program with hate in their hearts. And what I'm I calling upon the American people is to have some compassion, some awareness of the problems of human beings in this world. We have the have compassion and the awareness. That's tradition. why we're in Vietnam fighting for those people. Have some real freedom. awareness of U.S. traditions. I remember I meeting Bill Davidon, who was at that time a professor of physics at Haverford College. He was very involved in the anti-war movement. Unfortunately, the Justice Department has been secretive. It has used a whole range of devious means. Uh, we who have tried to the extent Bill was a guy who was in your face. Uh, he was a well-known activist. 
He'd been in many demonstrations. He was there sometimes with one of his little girls on his back, even. I think Bill was, was a kind of guy that uh, he was going to do what he was going to do. The idea of not running away from the action, don't just do it, but to stand up for doing it. I like that aspect of it. The violence among the anti-war movement itself was increasing. This was a, of great concern to Bill Davidon. People were getting so frustrated, and he was more and more concerned about people abandoning nonviolence. But at the same time, people in the anti-war movement kept telling Bill they feared there were FBI informers in their midst. There were people who you could tell were clearly agent provocateurs in some of the demonstrations. You know, you'd see a guy with a crew cut, wingtips, and a tie-dyed T-shirt on saying, kill the pigs. And you're like, <laughs> I think you need to go back to acting school, dude, because you're not pulling it off. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general and the black people in There were groups, the FBI investigated, there were groups that were intent on tearing down the government and, and, and causing disruption in the government. The weathermen were, were a violent element of this. These people robbed banks, they blew up uh, university facilities that dealt with the Defense Department. So we had informants in there. Uh, we also did some of these things against the Black Panther Party, which wasn't just doing something for civil rights, but they committed acts of violence. Now it wouldn't be done, but in those days there was really no prohibition against it. So if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. It was simply trying to wreck the groups that were trying to wreck the country. We knew very, very definitely that that kind of FBI surveillance was going to come down on on a, on a draft resistance movement. It was clear that, that that was happening. There were cameras everywhere. Everywhere you went, there was somebody taking your picture. And I saw how fear within the resistance community can break the spirit of that community. That is, what happens when you begin to think, maybe she's a double agent, that, that kind of thing. It shrinks the discourse. It, it shrinks the possibility of resistance. It makes you more afraid and more lonely. Bill felt if the FBI was suppressing dissent, it was as important to expose that as it was to end the war. But Bill knew hard evidence would be needed to convince the public that the FBI was suppressing dissent. So he tried to focus on what could be done the idea came to him from a trial that he attended. There was a group in Rochester, New York, called the Flower City Conspiracy. They had broken into an FBI office, and they were arrested. In a courtroom supercharged with emotion, Judge Harold Burke handed down jail sentences for all eight of the defendants. The terms ranged from 12... Suddenly, he realized they actually broke in to an FBI office, and they didn't succeed. But what if you could succeed? Bill immediately concluded that this has to be approached differently. He knew that for this to work, it had to be totally secret. So that, that meant that you had to work with, with people who would be willing to come in and close the curtains. Bill asked to meet with John and me to talk about an idea that he had break into an FBI office, remove files, and mail them to newspapers to try to bring to light activities that had been going on in secret. My first thought was it's, it, it, it would be impossible to do it. And an act of, of that sort would be a felony, and the legal jeopardy was so very, very different. I was like, whoa, the FBI, OK. <laughs> I presume Bill knew about my mechanical skills when he invited me. And if certain other people had asked me, I would have run the other way as fast as I could go. But I trusted Bill. If Bill thinks it could be done, it can probably be done. I don't believe I was ever asked to participate in an action that I said no. So it wasn't a big thing. But I was 20, 21 years old. I was immortal. 
I didn't even give any thought to what prison was going to be like. We began to meet. Nine of us at first. I would end up uh, only eight. Bill was clearly the leader. And we knew that if we were going to undertake this break-in under the FBI, we had to run a very tight ship. If you ask me what my job was, part of my job was comic relief. People like me and Keith, and we were younger, much younger than the rest of them. And we kind of thought Bill was a little uptight. We met at John and Bonnie's house. You know, coming in, it was like, whoa, there's little kids in this house. And I, that was like kind of a shocker. I remember sizing up the people. And there were a couple people that I thought were maybe not as solid as they should be. If you're nervous in a meeting talking about it, um, <laughs> you're really going to be nervous when you're inside the FBI office in the middle of the night. I felt two things at the same time. I felt a little bit like I was the den mother for the group. Um, they were staying at our house, and I was fixing meatballs and spaghetti. But it was expected that I was going to play that role almost exclusively. And I was not real happy about being a little bit marginalized in that kind of way. We knew that this was a very serious action. And we knew that if we got caught, uh, we were going to probably face very serious prison time. But we looked at the FBI office downtown in Philadelphia. That was impossible. That was in a federal building, and a federal building was active 24 hours a day. But back then, there were smaller FBI offices kind of scattered different places. So we looked up in the phone book, FBI, and sure enough, under media, there was an FBI office. It was inside the second floor of an apartment house. Media is a suburb of Philadelphia. The FBI has field offices and resident agencies. Resident agencies, at least in those days, were smaller, generally maybe only 20 agents at most, sometimes as few as four or five agents. Uh, they were not operated around the clock. We didn't have the same type of security. You locked the door when you left, you came back in the morning, unlocked the door. I wanted to see the layout myself. I didn't want to you know, rely on anybody else's opinion about it. And when I checked it out, there were certainly no alarms on the street door of the building. The, the office door was a regular old door with a regular old pin tumbler lock. I knew that we would find stuff in that office that indicated that they were doing things that were not only immoral, but probably illegal. And I'm like, OK, we might be able to actually do this. He's got a bomb in that package. Where is he? Next aisle over. Rice, FBI, put your hands up! The FBI television series was at its peak of popularity. It had been on since the early 60s. But that's sort of indicative of the popularity of the, of the FBI. Well, I think it's interesting if you look at Hoover. Hoover was appointed director in 1924. He's 29 years old. Clearly, he was a brilliant bureaucrat. That's part of the reason for his success. He understood power, and so he was willing to act as a servant, but wasn't a loyal servant of presidents who gave him broad latitude. It's almost unprecedented in the history of the Western world that one person would have been in charge of such an important, potentially influential and abusive agency for such a long time. The America we live in today must awaken to the danger. A tidal wave of lawless tyranny is now surging forth from the criminal and subversive underworlds. J. Edgar Hoover had a very particular conception of the United States. He was very suspicious of dissent against the Vietnam War. He was suspicious of people who wore beards or had long hair. He, he couldn't imagine that it was legitimate for people he would have regarded as hippies to influence policy 
war policy, foreign policy, by demonstrating in the streets. The politicians in Washington were almost uniformly afraid of the FBI. The FBI was not under the control of, of any government agency. Even the presidents of the United States were afraid of the FBI. And when you begin to confront a system of power that uses its power in unjust ways, that kind of violence must be seen, confronted, and resisted. This is something I learned, by the way, in 1961, when I flew to St. Louis and joined with three other people on the second Freedom Ride. The first Freedom Ride was terribly uh, beaten up in Anniston, Alabama. You, you have those pictures of the flames and, and, and the bus and so on. We got to uh, Little Rock, and there was a mob outside the bus station. That was not going to be the only time that my kind down south wanted to kill me. I was learning things I was never taught before. I was learning what power looks like and acts like when you're on the other side of power rather than the inside of power. Without that education, I don't think I would have ever gotten to Media, Pennsylvania in 1971. It progressed pretty rapidly in a, in a few months. I took a correspondence course on locksmithing, bought some spring steel and a grinding wheel, made some tools and started practicing. It's not hard to do. It's just a manual skill like anything else. A hell of a lot easier than playing the guitar. We had a perfectly calibrated plan and a schedule. So we had time frames and maps and drawings of the area. We tried to think of a name for ourselves, and finally we thought of the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. At that time, I was driving a cab part-time, so my hours were really flexible. So we did a lot of casing. We would usually case in man-woman pairs. That way, in case the cops thought the vehicle was suspicious or whatever, we could pretend that we were a couple. You can't imagine anything more boring than casing. But I had a terrible crush on Bonnie, so that made it much more interesting than if I'd been in the van with Keith. <laughs> we had to find out if there were electronic uh, alarms. In other words, we had to get inside. I was 29 at the time, but I was told all the time that I still looked like a kid. And so I was to become a Swarthmore student and make an appointment to interview the head of the office about opportunities for women in the FBI. Tom Lewis, nice to meet you. Nice Brenda. to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. I'm making a lot of small talk at that point, trying to get him to relax. And actually, I think he felt a little flattered. And he gave me about a half an hour of time, and he explained that opportunities were opening up for women in the FBI. I had to take notes with these glasses on that were really only for distance, so I couldn't really see what I was writing very well in my notebook. Do you mind if I have a copy of the application? He went to the cabinet, and I watched to see, you know, what the interior of the cabinet was like. It was full of file folders, and those were the things that we were going to be taking out. It was one of those steel cabinets where you just flip the handle and the door pops open. They didn't have locks. I think this is what you're looking for, actually. Great, thank you so much. This is perfect. Exactly. No alarms, nothing over the doors. The front door 
of the building was just a small lobby that was always open. So I think at that point we were really on track to move ahead and, and do it. Contracts were signed today for a heavyweight championship fight between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, a match at Madison Square Garden in New York on March 8th. We had to choose a night. It was clear that there was a big night coming up on March 8th. It was the biggest fight night of the year, of, of the decade. If Joe Frazier whoops me, I'm getting on my hands and my and knees. Crawl across the ring. Crawl across the ring. Look up at you, say, you're the champion. Well, I'll tell you, you what. I don't, you might this know. was an incredibly big event. Madison Square Garden was sold out as soon as the tickets went on sale. All over the world, the rights were bought to show it. I bet you they're going to be watching that fight, not listening for us, what we're doing downstairs uh, in that FBI office. Really just thought of myself as, you know, I'm the foot soldier. I'm here to get these guys in. And one of the particular concerns was that the county courthouse was right across the street and was very well lit, and the whole street area was very well lit. There was a guard that was on duty at all times in the courthouse, and they would have a clear view of the building that the FBI office was in. So blending in was important in that environment. So those of us who needed them got haircuts. Bill directed me to a very nice thrift shop in uh, Bryn Mawr where I got a Brooks Brothers sport coat for $5. Nobody in the group talked to anyone outside of the group about, about this. So there was no, it seemed to me there was no, no possibility of a leak until the ninth person in the group dropped out. Well, the ninth person knew who we were, uh, knew our names, knew how we put together the action. He had information that if he used, testified in court, it would put us in prison. I think he just got scared. The truth was that Bonnie was much more enthusiastic for the action than was I, probably from the beginning. But certainly in the last week before the action, I was getting some very strong feelings about what would happen if we had to spend years in prison. My worry was that we, the mom and dad, would put those three kids in a terrible situation. I remember having a discussion with John late at night after the children were in bed. We felt that just because we were parents didn't mean that we could remove ourselves from responsibility, that that would have been kind of a cop-out. We decided that we weren't um, going to be content when we continued to see things that really disturbed us. Obviously, we had to think about the worst-case scenario, which would be that we would be arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to federal prison. So we did talk to John's older brother, Bob, and his wife about what would happen to the children should we be put in prison. We had to know for sure that they would be cared for by family. Heavyweight boxers Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali meet in New York's Madison Square Garden tonight in what one promoter calls the biggest fight since Cain tangled with Abel. The hour of truth has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> The plan was that we would leave right after dinner and drive to a hotel, Holiday Inn, I think it might have been, where we had reserved a room. We went over every single detail that needed to be reviewed and contingency plans that we had. I drove to the office. I had some lock picks and a small pry bar inside my coat. I went in the building, I went up the stairs, and just about fainted. The door had a circular lock on it, the kind that nowadays you see on a kryptonite bike locks. I mean, that type of lock is extremely difficult to pick. I was like, 
was this here and I didn't see it, in which case I'm completely incompetent, or was this not here and now miraculously, right before we're gonna break in, it shows up, which means we've got a leak. It was certainly the sentiment at that point that we can't make this happen. I felt we got this far, uh, let's figure out what we can do. When the interview was over, instead of going back to the first office, I had to appear to be a little confused in order to see then to the third office. In the third office, there was another door that entered from the hallway, and in front of that door was this huge cabinet. I said I thought that if they pushed the cabinet very slowly and carefully across the carpet, they could make enough space to squeeze in that door. There was something blocking it just above the knob level, clearly a deadbolt. All right, this is the final round of the fight, and what a I could fight. hear the building manager watching the Ali Frazier fight directly underneath me. So I was listening to the TV and I was hoping for something like a swell. This time it went about an inch before it stopped. five minutes, just pushing a very small amount, much less than an inch each time. It was very nerve-wracking. I didn't want to take forever either, but I knew if I knocked that over, that was the end. I got it moved enough that I could get through the door. I pulled the door to, packed up my stuff, and left. The guard at the 
courthouse, came to the door and just stood there watching the street. And we got in and drove away and that was it. I was driving. And I think at that point, we could hardly breathe. We were so panicked and so relieved at the same time. We didn't get on the highway. We drove kind of the back way, and we headed for the place we were all going to meet. <laughs> There's so much material. I mean, there was a lot of stuff. People would take a couple files and start looking. But it didn't take very long before I remember somebody hollering in one of the rooms where we were sorting, you've got to come and look at this. I kind of assumed that all the illegal stuff would be, you know, you, nobody in their right mind would keep a written record of that. Uh, apparently, I was mistaken about that. A big, big proportion of what we had dealt with surveillance of people engaged in protected First Amendment activity. As soon as we saw how many of those files had nothing to do with crime and everything to do with political activity. We knew that the FBI was doing the things we thought they were doing. They have FBI agents in all the colleges, universities. Crazy stuff. Sending investigators to a Boy Scout troop out in Oregon because they were corresponding with some Boy Scout troop behind the Iron Curtain. Hiring uh, one of the telephone operators at Swarthmore College to uh, keep the tabs on progressive teachers and students. Okay, black student groups on college campuses. These are plans to infiltrate colleges with FBI agents to keep tabs on all the different groups that they consider anti-American. An FBI agent had infiltrated this anti-war group on a campus, a college campus. There was a married couple and this agent started a rumor that the wife was cheating on the husband and he broke the marriage up. And that was in the file. He was proud of it. We knew it was going to take several days of sorting the files before we could even begin to mail them. We all had gloves on. We never took gloves off. Anytime you're around the documents, you have gloves on. Bill and I had access to a photocopy machine. He at uh, Haverford and uh, myself at Temple. And the first mailing was my responsibility. I decided to drive up to Princeton uh, and mail them from the Princeton Post Office uh, because that would send some agents up there, I guess. The morning that the uh, documents arrived was a Tuesday morning. There hadn't been much publicity about the burglary. I think that the Post covered an AP story that was maybe two paragraphs. So I didn't expect to be receiving the stolen FBI documents. What I was reading was surreal. There were postal carriers who were giving information about a professor's homes, uh, mailroom people on campuses who were opening mail. I was particularly struck by one document advising agents to behave in such a way that people would think that there was an FBI agent behind every mailbox. It really didn't seem possible that that would be an FBI document. I mean, even if something like that was happening, uh, would there be a, a record of it? I talked with the editors about it. The first thing we needed to do was to confirm their authenticity. It turned out that that was the easiest thing for us to do because the Justice Department was quite eager to confirm that they were authentic and therefore they should never see the light of day. The documents had gone to two members of Congress and both of them uh, had held press conferences and announced that this was a, a crime and that they didn't want to have anything to do with it and that uh, they were giving the documents back to the FBI. Congressman Mitchell was critical, but said, I read these documents, and these documents uh, reveal illegal activity 
by the FBI and something, there should be an investigation. On the same day that I received the files, the New York Times Washington Bureau and the LA Times Washington Bureau also received them and did the same thing as the two members of Congress. Uh, they immediately hand delivered them to the FBI at the Washington Post. It was a struggle. It was a struggle. At that time, no news organization had dealt with what do you do when you're handed stolen documents. And so that day, in just a few hours, they had to confront those issues. The attorney general was on the phone repeatedly urging them not to publish. Catherine Graham had a very difficult time making these decisions. If those struggles had not taken place, the decisions later on, on on Watergate probably would have been much more difficult. The editors took the very strong stance that the fact that this was going to reveal something about the most powerful agency in the government, that was an extremely important story. By 10 o'clock that night, they did decide to publish. And the story ran the next day on the front page above the fold. It was huge news. The blunt fact is that for millions of decent and loyal Americans, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has become the Federal Bureau of Intimidation. Newspapers that had never done anything except praise the FBI wrote very critical editorials. There were also were those who were strongly condemning the burglary. What we have here is a deliberate effort to turn the FBI in the eyes of the American people into an American version of the Gestapo. This is not a police state. I've been to police states. I know what they are. <laughs> This was really a frightening set of developments for a lot of the American public. You mean you can't have faith in our government, in the FBI? How could this be? This is the government. The government can do whatever it wants. Don't you know that? Oh, He's violating the Bill of Rights. It's against the Constitution. Don't be bothering the US government with the Constitution. <laughs> People were now uh, when you went and talked to somebody confidentially, they said, well, we just saw in the Philadelphia Inquirer that an FBI agent was talking to so-and-so and, -so and the registrars. Are, and so it certainly made more difficult obtaining sources of information. Neither Mr. Hoover's friends nor his foes here on Capitol Hill expect him to retreat or retire under the heaviest political shelling of his half-century at the helm of the FBI. Is there any uh, uh, response on your part to the suggestions that you resign? I have no comment to make on that. Hoover wasn't saying anything publicly at the time. Uh, one of his favored reporters wrote an article soon after this saying that Hoover's reaction was apoplectic. I, I think he must have been beside himself. And it was nice to think that we could yank his chain like that. <laughs> because I really hated the man very, very much. I mean, it was, it was, uh, the fallout was immense. Just insane. You know, just the idea that they're closing up these offices all over the country, spending millions to transfer agents out of these prison agencies. Spending millions uh, on unproductive work of guarding them day and night. I remember I had one thought, and it wasn't surprising, for, for, first of all. Why? Uh, I think we'd had a number of indications uh, up to that time that. Well, there's one in Rochester that didn't, that failed. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons it failed in Rochester is because they got safes for them to put their sensitive documents that they keep out there. Well, you know, you really had to train them to lock up what was sensitive. On the very first day, 
after the burglary, the FBI decided who had been in charge of, of this burglary and that it had been John Peter Grady, who had been a leader in the draft board raids. John Grady was a very well-known, outsized personality, and there were many rumors flying around that it was John that had led the media burglary. He was a wonderful person, but discretion was not his strong point. There were a number of people who told me that in confidence, that it was John Grady, and it was, it was quite hard not to crack up at that one, but uh, that was a widespread assumption on both sides of the fence. So thousands of people who had been at anti-war rallies were the first group of people who were viewed uh, as, as potential suspects in the case. A flock of agents was rushed into the area to question suspects, workers, housewives, anybody. He put a folder down on the table, which very quickly it became evident to me that it was a folder uh, on me, because as he opened it, there was a, uh, a picture of me they asked if uh, we had ever discussed the FBI at any of our women's liberation meetings. And I said, you've got to be kidding. When Hoover discovered that this woman had come into the office and, and interviewed the agent in charge, he was extremely upset. They had a Philadelphia police artist draw a sketch, and that sketch was distributed to FBI agents all over the country. The FBI, through the whole East Coast constituency, 150 agents were looking for us. 150 agents. They were flooding Philadelphia. Powelton is heavily populated by college students, liberals, Berrigan sympathizers, radicals and activists, and now, it seems, by hordes of FBI agents. According to people in Powelton, these are FBI agents attempting to blend into the neighborhood. This is how one resident described the newcomers. All of the agents were dressed in hippie-to-be, which means that they were letting their hair grow, they were letting their beards grow, but they stood out like sore thumbs in the neighborhood. One night, at supper time, a number of agents went to a Powelton address, executing what the Bureau said was a duly authorized warrant in a lawful manner. Sunday night, about 7 o'clock, I was upstairs having dinner with a friend, and we heard tremendous commotion and someone trying to break into one of the apartments in the building. I yelled down what was going on, and somebody yelled back, FBI. When they left, they took, however, the uh, notes that I was using to write articles from the copies of copies of media FBI files, as well as my typewriter, stapler, books, and other... It was not a great area of town, and there were lots of different break-ins, but you certainly didn't need an ax to get into, <laughs> into my door. I basically was a low-level journalist, and we had the documents pretty quickly after the break-in. So I was, I was an easy target. This was a physical threat, a show of force to the whole community, and it was meant to scare people. And I think the FBI had broken into a lot of people. I think that the Panthers knew this stuff, up one side and down the other. I think it was the first time that white middle class people, I think that was the first. You, you know, you tell Billy not to poke the bear, and it isn't until Billy pokes the bear that he knows why he's not supposed to do that, right? So, I mean, they were pissed off, and they were just everywhere. I was working for the state of Pennsylvania. I was a caseworker. I was in, in my office, and I went downstairs, and there's a couple of FBI agents waiting to talk to me. They escorted me to their car, and they're just sort of peppering me with questions. I, did, I basically said, you know, fellas, uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything you want to hear. You might as well take me home. And they did. They drove me. <laughs> they drove me right to my apartment. They wanted me to know that, you know, they knew where I lived. There were a lot of likely suspects. I mean, we saw that in Palton Village when they're calling on people at random. But the longer that went on, the funnier it actually got. 
streets. This neighborhood has a history of having street fairs, and we're just using a different kind of content this time. We're going to be auctioning off media files. We're going to be selling full life-size portraits of the FBI agents who've been infiltrating our neighborhood, and just in general having a good time. And behind every mailbox looks a seedy, tweedy man who reads your cards and letters and throws you in the can. You better not drown. You better not smile. You better not steal a media file. The FBI is coming to town. You're made to feel like an outlaw from the American society just for living here. Uh, you can't walk down the street without somebody watching you and trying to figure out who you're related to, where you're going, what you're all about, and putting you into a little pigeonhole. There was a part of Bill that really liked risk. He almost enjoyed what was going on. He was in churches uh, and schools talking about these FBI files. He was not a guy that was going to be frightened. But for those first few weeks after the publication, uh, and the FBI was everywhere, uh, we were scared. So we went underground metaphorically. That is, we talked to no one about what we'd done. I didn't use the phone in our house. I would go to the payphone at the corner. We had to instruct the children that if strange men came to the front door and asked to speak to their mother or their father, that they were to tell them, no, you can't. A couple of times they said there would be a car behind us with two men in it, and they wondered whether they were FBI men. It really did sort of permeate our fears to a great extent. I had, of course, heard of the event, that nothing else was going on like that uh, in those days. The draft board raids, there were over 350 of them. Um, there were lots of actions at, at, uh, aimed at the draft and at the war, but um, this, was, uh, this was new. I was approached by two members of the group, and the way I understand it, they all kind of knew if, if they got busted, they could call me. It wasn't like a mystery of what crimes they could be charged with, right? It was, it was all, nothing subtle, and I certainly couldn't think of any constitutional right to break into an FBI office. So um, this, was, this was quite substantial a risk they took. Well, I didn't know, no one knew that every photocopying machine has its own signature. And that Xerox knew exactly which machine made that copy. J. Edgar Hoover demanded that they reveal which machines these were. I was in my office at Temple, and I heard our department secretary talking to somebody about our Xerox machine. I looked out the window, I saw a white car with a Xerox logo on it, and I saw him leave with the drum, and I called Bill. You better do something about your drum out there. He scratched the drum, but we knew that that was one path that could lead to our door. Well, it was only a few weeks after the break-in, and the doorbell rings. And it's the number nine guy, the guy who dropped out, and he's there. And he wants to come in, and we invite him in. And he says, I'm thinking about turning you in. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I mean, he said that. And he said, the reason is I've been told that there are some secret files that are very sensitive, bearing upon national security, and that uh, you haven't sent those to the newspapers yet, but uh, you can do it anytime you decide to. And I assured him 
That was not the case. I'm telling you the truth. There's nothing in those documents, national security stuff. And he seemed to accept that, but he left. And our lives, our futures left with him. It's been over two months now, and the FBI hasn't been able to nab the thieves who stole the FBI's own documents in Pennsylvania. One day they will, but in the meantime, those in-basket burglars keep publicizing choice bits from the documents, thinking of themselves, obviously, as Robin Hoods mocking the blundering sheriff of Nottingham. We haven't touched this... I tried to sort of keep my distance a little bit from anything associated with media. By that point in time, I was pretty sure that there was no chance they were going to catch all of us. And if they were going to catch anybody, it would be because of some kind of a leak. Because if there had been any physical evidence, we'd screwed up by leaving somebody's fingerprint behind or something. You know, that would have been, we would have known about that pretty quickly. I was very anxious to do something again. So now that we've broken into an FBI office and stolen documents showing that they're doing stuff that's against the law, how do you top that one? Uh, a few months after that, I got a call to participate in the, <clears throat> in the Camden action. The, th the thing to remember in my case about media is that media led direct, directly to Camden. And Camden turned out to be a much more emotionally intense experience. Camden was where I got caught. The FBI early today caught an anti-war group in the act as it was trying to steal records from a draft board in Camden, New Jersey. Twenty persons were arrested, including two Catholic priests and a Protestant minister. I was not terribly enamored with Camden when it was first presented to me. Some of the people that were involved made me extremely nervous 30 seconds after I met them. But it was one of those circumstances where, well, you can either join this one or you can join none because that's the only one on offer at the moment. The only person in the group who knew that I was involved in media was Bob, and I, I knew Bob wasn't going to talk. That would be the last thing that you would do, would be to uh, give up somebody else in order to, to save yourself. Did I think I was going to go to jail? Yeah. Did I think it was going to be uh, uncomfortable and so on and so forth? Yes. I, uh, all of that was clear to me. Um, but things like how it affects your family, um, or how it's going to affect the rest of your life in some ways. No, I, I didn't really think about that kind of stuff. My parents felt like they were being shamed, banished from the polite company of the community. My mother was embarrassed by the whole thing. You can actually make her cry if you ask her about that, still to this day. If you look at the way they went after the Camden 28, they wouldn't let him out on bail. They sought 47 years. They, they were just vicious. The trial lasted for three months. Our goal was to tell our story, to explain why we had done what we had done, and to call on the jury as an act of conscience to make a statement about this war by finding us not guilty. We did use the media papers to cross-examine the FBI witnesses quite effectively, you know. What does it mean that you wanted to create paranoia and have the, the new left think there's an FBI agent behind every mailbox? What did you do to further that? The Camden jury heard questions like that and the lack of a good explanation from the FBI. The government today lost yet another of its cases against anti-war activists. Uh, we've been having a uh, guilty, guilty, guilty for five years for proposing this war. And we finally got it not guilty. The people understood. It was such an incredible shock to be found not guilty by these people. And then all of a sudden, I am finding myself with a life ahead of me that I have done absolutely no thinking about. I mean, I thought my days were going to be planned uh, by the, the federal government. My friends, to them it was like, okay, we just won a battle, it's on to the next battle. For me, I wanted the war to be over. Finally, I began to think, okay, we're going to be safe. I don't think they ever got close. And the reason they didn't is because they thought they caught us when they caught the Camden 28. But they had five years to bring indictments, and that was a long period. 
It was the end of the 60s for us. That this was, this, this was our signing out. We were exhausted uh, emotionally and felt, I think, that we'd, we'd done our share and now we need to get on with other things. The FBI watches people and activities in this country, but who watches the FBI? Uh, we have uh, never been kept in the dark as to uh, uh, activities of the FBI. It's not too long ago that a certain uh, uh, member of the House inquired of me, to what extent does Mr. Hoover level with you with regard to these wiretaps? I said, I think he levels all the way. I never knew him to be anyone except to put everything right there on the table. Well, he says, suppose you were the... Media is a real problem for the FBI. Media is open sesame. It was like a hole had opened in the dam and water was pouring out. It was the, the fortress was under siege. There is not the immediate sense in 71 that we have to abandon completely our past. Uh, there is a greater sense of caution, uh, but there is a, a sense that maybe we can continue. The thing that most concerned them were whether or not uh, COINTELPRO would be revealed. Only one of the documents I received contained the term COINTELPRO. Now that meant nothing to me, and apparently not to anybody else who received it at that time and, and wrote about it. But of all the stolen files, that one would have the most far-reaching impact. Including others. One man was prosecuted two years ago. For I started covering the Justice Department in 1967. Part of my job was to cover the FBI. In the early spring of 1972, as part of the general inquiry into how the FBI was handling its uh, investigations of anti-war activities, anti-Vietnam War activities, um, I went to an office, a Senate office, where I th thought I could pick up a copy of a, of a document or a, or a report, and uh, uh, the staff member said they would get it for me, but I'd have to wait a few minutes. They, things were backed up with a photocopy machine and handed me some, some papers that she thought I might uh, care about. I was not aware of the media break-in, and I didn't know where this document had uh, come from. But to my astonishment, there was a piece of paper in there instructing agents to write and, and to mail anonymous letters to uh, campus uh, educators to take a stronger stand against the new left. And I wondered, what, what is this? Right, do FBI agents write anonymous letters of this sort? Uh, there was a, 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 a caption that said, COINTELPRO NEW LEFT. I have filed uh, within several days a formal written Freedom of Information Act request. Tell me what this is, and I want to see what documents establish this program uh, and what are its uh, dimensions. What followed was uh, months and months of uh, my asking, and they're sending me letters of denial. Finally, I, I sued. And the judge to whom this case was assigned reviewed these documents privately and ordered the documents released to me. Initially, the department provided four pieces of paper in response to my request. But uh, those pieces of paper themselves referenced other communications and listed not one COINTELPRO program being ended, but seven. Ultimately, that led to their release of 50,000 pages. We went from four, we got to 50,000. The FBI once considered installing an informant as imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and distributed a Black Panther coloring book that depicted the police as saber-toothed pigs. These and many other dirty tricks carried out by the Bureau were revealed by the FBI itself yesterday when it released more than 50,000 pages from files on its counterintelligence program, codenamed COINTELPRO. 
The papers tell of a 15-year campaign of dirty... COINTELPRO had started back actually in 1956 with a program that J. Edgar Hoover had initiated involving the Communist Party. But it had expanded over the years. Uh, so that we know that roughly, I don't know, 22, 2300 of these programs aimed at specific individuals and organizations did, were undertaken. Ramsey Clark, who was attorney general when it started, called the program deplorable and said in his judgment, those who took part are indictable. Carl Stern Stern's request was for COINTELPRO, and he could make that request because this pilfer document contained the caption COINTELPRO. Because if you don't know about COINTELPRO, how can you ask for the COINTELPRO file? So the media break, in a, if one looks at it in the long-term sense, it's a major event. It opens up the possibility of understanding what FBI officials had been doing for decades. And then it comes at this really critical time where people are beginning to question the role of the intelligence agencies. You have this inquiry into the Watergate break-in, and COINTELPRO suggests that, that it's not simply a Nixon problem. For the first time, they have access to FBI records, unrestricted access, and it's a different ballgame. Today, we are here to review the major findings of our full investigation of FBI domestic intelligence, including the COINTEL program. By 1975, Congress was willing to investigate, and the church committee hearings were held in the Senate. It was the first time that a legislative body in the United States investigated its intelligence agencies. In the area of what they characterize as the new left, uh, an example... COINTELPRO was infinitely worse than, than people knew before all the information came out. I mean, the hints of how bad it was were there, but the hints are not, are not the same as getting the rich and extensive detail that, that we obtained. In the area of women's liberation, report after report about meetings of women who got together to talk about their problems. Now, how the Bureau got this information is not entirely clear, but it's apparently by informants. Uh, reports on particular women who said why they had come to the meeting and how she felt depressed, sexually or otherwise. Nothing to do with violence, nothing to do with these labels of subversion and extremism. And what's the conclusion on the document? Quotes, we'll continue to follow and report the activities of the women's liberation movement. Uh, in, the area in any of event, the most dramatic testimony today involved the surveillance of Martin Luther King. The committee staffers described in detail attempts to discredit and to destroy King. Uh, the Bureau went so far as to mail anonymous letters to Dr. King and his wife, which were mailed shortly before he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, and finishes with this suggestion. King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do it. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason. It has definite practical significance. It was 34 days before the award. You are done. Uh, if I can interrupt. That was taken by Dr. King to mean a suggestion for suicide, was it not? That's our understanding, Senator. It was bad stuff. It was un-American, it was harmful, it was a disgrace to our country, it hurt the reputation of the FBI. I think a government program with secrecy and no oversight is bound to have mission creep and go from the wrong but understandable to the horrible and ununderstandable. I've been told for years by some of my own family that this is exactly what the Bureau was doing all the time. And in my great wisdom, I assured them they were on pot. This just wasn't true. Couldn't happen. They wouldn't do it. What you've described is a series of illegal actions intended squarely to deny First Amendment rights to some Americans. And that's what my children have told me was going on. The trick now as I say to the chairman, is for this committee to be able to figure out how to persuade 
the people of this country that indeed it did go on. And how shall we ensure that it never happened again? My impression at the time was that never would have happened without us. Now, that could be wrong, but that's, that's how I felt at the time. You know, I didn't, never thought it would be permanent, which history has shown that it wasn't, but, uh, but at least it backed him off for a while. At least for one brief moment, there was a flash picture of the abuse, abuse of power with no proper oversight, no accountability. But that door was shut, and we haven't had a peek at it since. And it just isn't media. When you look at history, I mean, there are other things. Lincoln did it. It's the nature of government. It's happened. It will happen. It's going to happen. There's nothing to stop it. And there's everything to guarantee it. Yeah, these are pins, uh, never used, you know, new ones for when you're uh, changing the combination of a lock for somebody. Just some miscellaneous lock parts. It's a long time ago, uh, and a lot's happened. The country's changed a lot in the intervening periods. I really kind of stopped being active when the kids were born. And we didn't talk about it much. I mean, it wasn't the kind of thing we discussed at the dinner table. Uh, I didn't regale them with war stories or anything like that. In our case, a lot of the stuff that happened in the 60s and, and 70s, you know, we're getting older. We're not going to be around a lot longer. And I was very concerned, uh, you know, when I saw that Bill's health was failing. You know, I was just another participant. There was hundreds of thousands of people like me. Um, but there, there weren't hundreds of thousands of people like Bill. He made some really tremendous contributions and took some, some big risks and made some big sacrifices. And I, I really wanted to see the story come out before it was too late. Raven, do you want ribs or chicken, hun? Ribs. Ribs, please. Today, I would definitely describe myself as being much more conservative than I was yeah. in my 20s. What happened there is, is a bunch of ordinary people got together, did an extraordinary thing, which I believe had mostly positive consequences. Um, I certainly believe we all meant well. You raise your hand when the teacher asked and at the same questions. time, yeah. I am aware now, in retrospect, okay. that there were any number of unintended consequences that f flowed from those actions. One of the effects of what we did was to raise the level of cynicism in this country. And so the power of unintended consequences has caused me to want to make smaller waves. I'm about a little pebble here, a little pebble there. In the sky. We do think about what we were involved in back then as leading up to some of the things that are happening today, and there are certain parallels. As the years passed and we began to see it sort of receding in terms of interest in nailing these people, I think we just felt, oh, well, that was then, and this is now, and there's a story to be told. To me, it was like hearing about some sort of World War II spy novel. And somewhere along the line, I told my best friend about the story, because I knew I could trust him. I'd known him since fifth grade. He was like, come on. You know, what are you going to tell us next? Or art thieves or something? There was, I think, a time after which they first told me, I was like, how could they put all of us at risk? How would I have been raised by my Uncle Bob? How different would I be? Well, they could have gone to prison for life, you know. And then, you know, I can't imagine having someone else raise my children. 
I don't know how you go on. Like, how do you have, live a normal life without thinking every day? They could come in the middle of the night, you know, and take me away, and that's the end of everything that you've built as a family. I think some people will say, how could you be so foolish? How could you have put them in that kind of jeopardy? The answer I have to that is, if all of us simply did what we thought was safe, that would let people who want to take our government away from us get away. They would be safe. We wouldn't be safe. They risked everything. But I don't think my parents ever thought that what they did was a crime. They saw injustice and decided that they were going to act on it in an American citizen's uh, way. Stay tuned for a conversation with 1971 filmmaker Joanna Hamilton. I'm Joanna Hamilton, director of 1971, and I'm here with my colleague, Betty Metzger, journalist at The Washington Post in 1971 and author of The Burglary, The Discovery of J. Edgar Hoover's Secret FBI, and Laura Poitras, co-executive producer on 1971 and now Oscar-winning director of Citizen Four. We came to work together um, in late 2009. Tell me, at the time, you had been researching the book for a very long time. What were you doing in terms of protection of sources? I didn't really think that there was any chance that the burglars would be char criminally charged if they became public, as we planned to do. But I wasn't sure. And so from the beginning, I kept their names out of all of my, all of my papers uh, and in our communications with each other. And in fact, in the manuscript, when I submitted it to the publisher originally, there were numbers <laughs> instead of names. And I didn't use the names in the manuscript until the last possible time uh, before it went to press. And Laura, when I first came to see you, which was also late 2009, early 2010, you and I sat down over coffee and I told you the story. You were familiar with it, both familiar, and you also had concerns, didn't you? I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I had known the story about the burglary, and I was, I thought it was incredible that they were coming forward. I mean, this was, they had managed to remain anonymous for so many years, and they had made the, the bold decision to come forward. And, and, and I knew the story because I was already working on a project about the NSA, and, you know, and obviously the, the church committee and what we learned from the burglary and the, what was going on with the FBI and spying on the civil rights um, organizations was, I mean, this was kind of the bedrock of understanding the sort of um, the government overstepping its boundaries and, and what happened, you know, in, in a positive sense in terms of the reform. So then in mid-2013, um, I was in the edit studio um, finishing the film. At least we were approaching the end of the edit. Um, Betty, you were approaching the end of the book. And lo and behold, the Snowden revelations start coming. Um, Betty, can you talk a little bit about your process um, and the impact that the Snowden revelations had on the book? Well, my first reaction after I read the first story was, oh, I, I can't believe this is happening again, uh, separated by 40 some years. I did feel it might be construed as a quaint piece of history. and. Here we are, you were the one putting it on the, the front pages. Well, I mean, I think the answer to the question is clearly in, in your film. I mean, when you have the government with this kind of power doing these kinds of things in secret, um, and then also how it can be used to target people who are engaged in legitimate um, political activities. I mean, you have the spying on Martin Luther King, for instance, that was revealed um, ultimately by the COINTELPRO and the, and, the, and the burglary. So, I mean, these kinds of things are really threats to our democratic system. And I'm really curious what your, you know, what your response was when you first received these documents. How did you, what did you do? How did you respond? Um, I mean, one of the, I think the most shocking things in the film is that some news organizations returned the files. Um, as I read the, the files, uh, some of it seemed so bizarre that I thought maybe it was, was a hoax. But then after they were confirmed by the FBI as being authentic, and the editor of the paper, Ben Bradley. And the reason they confirmed them very quickly was that they thought that by telling us they were authentic, that we would then readily go along with their saying, don't publish. And of course, that was not the position that we took, or at least the editors and I took. And what I had to worry about was something that seems quite a quaint now, which are fingerprints, but also, as I soon learned, the markings on, on the paper that copiers in those days left uh, markings that could lead uh, to finding the machine on which the copy had been made. I decided that uh, if subpoenaed to testify about the files, that I, I would refuse to do so, and that if that led to contempt and, and going to jail, that this information was so important that, that that was a worthwhile thing to do. Physically, did you maintain possession of the files, or, were they, or did you share them with Bradley? I think almost at the end of the two-month period that the files kept coming in, um, Bradley said, we ought, I ought to have a copy of them. I found out that if you make multiple generations of files, that the things I feared uh, could be retained on them and be helpful to law enforcement in searching for the, for the burglars would disappear. And so I went out to a distant <laughs> copy machine, and I made multiple copies, destroyed the original copies I received, plus the early generation, kept an, a set for myself, and then gave Bradley a set. And the agreement that we had was that they would be in a big um, envelope and that the envelope would be sealed, his signature would be across the seal, and that no one could open that file or have any kind of access to it. It was placed in the safe across from Catherine Graham's office. But a year later, when someone went to get the, the, uh, the package, it was gone and never had an explanation for it. I think what's so extraordinary about your film, I mean, here, you know, we have um, sources who'd managed to remain anonymous for 40 years, and to be able to not just n learn their names, but actually to meet them and see who they are. The archival footage is extraordinary. And how was it for you, like, when you first met with them, and what did it mean for you to be able to document? Oh, it was, it was incredible. I mean, and I was, you know, very struck by simultaneously how they had kept this secret for 40 years how simultaneously relaxed they were. Um, you know, I felt much more nervous for them, Betty and I both did. Um, 
and how they still, 40 years on, had these very passionate beliefs. As a print journalist, I would like to say something about the, the importance of, of what your films add. Um, I mean, it's not just the emotion, but also the original knowledge that, that you create a record of, but also adding credibility to the story. So far, I've been incredibly gratified to see that we've had a really good mix in the crowd. People who were politically active in the 70s who remember that era so well. And then there's a younger generation walking away inspired by the story, um, making the connections between then and now.